You're listening to Health Innovators, a podcast and video show about the leaders, influencers, and early adopters who are shaping the future of healthcare. I'm your host, Dr. Roxy Mooney. Welcome back to the show, Health Innovators. On today's episode, I'm sitting down with Erica Barnell, who is the Chief Science Officer and co-founder of Genoscopy. Welcome to the show, Erica. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure to be here. It is good to have you here. So you are my second back-to-back episode of a health tech innovator who is innovating around uh, testing and diagnostics, completely different um, use case and area of focus. Um, But I would say that the diagnostics industry is super hot right now, and I'm excited to dig into that a little bit deeper with you today. But before we do that, if you could tell our audience a little bit about your background and what you've been innovating these days. Absolutely. So I'm an MD PhD candidate from um, Wash U here in St. Louis. Um, during my education, I was in a microbiome lab and I was interested in understanding a little bit more about diagnostics and how I could apply the research that I have been doing um, to transforming healthcare for patients in the clinic. Um, and so I came across some really amazing technology to non invasively diagnose gastrointestinal disease. Um, And I've built the company Genoscopy around developing those non-invasive tools to help patients who suffer from gastrointestinal disease, um, whether it be screening for colorectal cancer, all the way to diagnosing and monitoring inflammatory bowel disease. So what is happening in the in the market? What you know, what is seems to be creating this um, uh, perfect storm of Mm -hmm. this um, uh, emergence of so many health tech innovators like yourself that are solving some of these problems with new diagnostic solutions? Absolutely. I think when you actually think about modern medicine, um, it's, it's a pretty new field, right? We've, we've really only had a hundred years of what is modern medicine. Um, and in the last, you know, decade or 15 years, that component of modern medicine has exploded with the understanding of the genome, with our ability to apply precision medicine applications to almost every field in the industry. And I think diagnostics has developed um, on that forefront as we move from treating everybody for the same disease to customizing our approaches for each individual and diagnosing each person um, as a unique person. And I think the, the reason that diagnostics has exploded is that is really our only tool right now to segregate individuals and make sure that we're treating someone based on who they are and what their genetics are saying, and not necessarily just what they're presenting with as a disease. You know, one of the things that comes to mind is, um, you know, that old medicine um, that was practiced uh, well over a hundred years ago, where maybe they were giving patients morphine or maybe even giving them like some form of heroin for, you know, these treatment modalities. And you're like, oh my gosh, what were they thinking? That's Mm -hmm. insane. We would never do that today. I can imagine that here in just a few years from now, we will look back and go, what were we thinking, thinking that everyone that had the same diagnosis were all the exact same and so they needed the same treatment plan? (laughs) Absolutely. I I completely agree with you. I think, you know, right now we're in a in a place where evidence based medicine is paramount, right? Um, We're trying to understand if it's safe and efficacious. And those two components are are so important. Um, And again, I think just being able to apply precision medicine, not just to oncology, which is kind of where it came about in its first iteration, but yeah. to other things like autoimmune diseases and um, you know things beyond oncology. Sure. So when did you um, launch this company? Yeah, I, uh, I kind of had the idea for the company during my first year of, of the MD PhD program. Um, I've been doing a ton of microbiome research for a disease called environmental enteropathy, which truly only afflicts children in Africa and Asia um, that are in conditions that cause inflammation in their GI tract, like poor water and poor food. Um, So it was a very small disease and a very obscure application. 
Um, but at that time, I was conducting my clinical um, rotations in the hospital at Washington University. And at that time, I met a woman who had stage four colorectal cancer, um, mm. presented to the hospital with really late stage disease, even though she was only 52 at the time. And I kind of thought about it and said, you know, I'm using this very amazing technology to diagnose disease for kids in Africa using stool samples, just getting the diapers from babies. And I have this woman in my hospital who didn't have the time or means to go get a colonoscopy. And I kind of bridged those two worlds together, um, what I've been doing at the bench and what I'm seeing at the bedside and thought, why don't I try to see if I can help this woman? So uh, that was about six and a half years ago. And today we're, we're one step closer to, uh, to bringing a diagnostic to a patient like the one I met in the hospital. Yeah. Um, you know, in one of my previous conversations, I talked about this innovation journey as a long, hard slog. And, and it sounds like, you know, you can be a testimony to that firsthand, right? Yeah. Um, so as you think about the last six years, what have been some of the milestones that you've accomplished as you've made some progress in that journey? Yeah, and I'll, I'll preface it. It looks like a long stream of just, you know, amazing milestones where we just checked the box. Um, it was more like a drunken bee just buzzing around, you know, we go <laughs> place to place. Uh, there are some days where we're successful. There are some days we're not. Um, and that's entrepreneurship for you. But, you know, over the last six years, we've gone from three students and an idea um, all the way to just recently submitting our PMA to the FDA for approval for our lead assay, which is a colorectal cancer screening test. So we've had two successful fundraisers. Um, we've had four patents that, that we've filed to protect our technology. We've built out a CAPCLIA laboratory uh, to support both the clinical trial, the pivotal study, as well as commercialization, which we expect in the spring of, of next year. We have grown the company to over 60 employees, um, and I'm proud to say we have you know multiple pipelines now, not just in oncology to help that woman that really yeah. inspired me in the beginning, but also in inflammatory diseases. How exciting. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> How exciting. So there's a lot of our listeners that are really early stage. And so I um, often will give our guests an opportunity to describe what that funding journey has been like um, to be able to share wisdom and some encouragement with um, those that are um, maybe um, a little bit earlier in that journey than you are now. Um, or maybe those that are just really struggling, especially in the climate that we have today when it comes to fundraising. So could you maybe just share some stories around that? Absolutely. And I think, you know, I still feel like I'm there. Uh, I remember it so well. You know, I look back, it was six years ago, but, um, you know, I remember the struggle and, you know, worrying if we're, if the idea is stupid and pitching to investors and yeah. hearing no a lot more, more than a lot. Um, and I just, I think that it has been a very fun, but long journey, um, specifically with regards to fundraising. I think one of the things that we did well, um, is that we started our company here in St. Louis. Um, I think we had the opportunity to go to the coast and to go to a city that was maybe more well known for entrepreneurship, um, like Silicon Valley or Boston or whatnot. But um, I think we chose to stay here. Um, I was born and raised here. We have an amazing entrepreneurial community and we've been able to bootstrap really effectively in a smaller town. Um, you know, mm -hmm. we still can raise funds on the coast, but... <clears throat> cost of living is less expensive here. The cost to get a lab is less expensive. The cost to, you know, hire amazing talent um, is less expensive. So I think that's one of the things that allowed us to stretch our fundraising rounds a little bit further and have runway. Yeah. Um, and the only other thing I would add is, uh, you know, like I said, you hear no so many times. Um, and I just think that if, if you can keep that momentum and not get too discouraged, um, you only need one or two. So I'm not sure if you know this, but statistically, um, women 
struggle with getting access to funding in um, much, much, much more challenging for women than it is for men. Um, yeah. And that um, I believe the last stat that I um, had in my presentation a few months ago on this was that only like less than 3% of the funding is going to women owned healthcare companies, which mm -hmm. is crazy when you think about all of the brilliant women that are out there and all of the women's health issues that need to be addressed and solved. Um, and, um, but, but also statistically that if you pair up with a male co-founder, that all of a sudden it increases your chances pretty significantly over 15% of getting access to funding. And you have a male co-founder. I do. Um, <laughs> I'm fully aware of that statistic. Um, I, I mentor a lot of women in uh -huh. business and um, healthcare specifically, mm -hmm. and women, women of color more yeah. particularly, uh, it's just very, uh, inequitable is what I would say. I, I yeah. did join forces with my brother, um, Andrew Barnell, who not just um, because he was a man, <laughs> not just because, uh, he went through the full, full vetting process. He, he applied, um, yeah, right. <laughs> he had the, uh, the business, um, components. So he's an MBA from Wharton. Um, he had four years in, uh, investment banking and, and private equity. So, um, the two of us, kind of me on the science side and him on the business side, did allow for us to be very successful in, in fundraising. Um, so I, I, I that those statistics were very, very apt for us, I would say. That's awesome. Um, so um, let's talk uh, a little bit about the um, the FDA process. And, um, you know, if there's any kind of lessons learned, obviously you don't have approval yet, but you've made your submission, which is a huge milestone. Um, but, you know, when you look back on this, um, is there, are there any lessons learned that you would want to share with our audience? Absolutely. I think everybody's so scared of the FDA. Um, they're so scared, right? And investors warn you, you're, the FDA is going to be awful. It's going to be horrible. It's going to be such a slog. Yeah. I've had great relationships with the people at the FDA. Um, they're just a group of nerds like me and my team, right? Like they're just science people, um, you know, upholding the, the, you know, the guidance that they put forth and they put forth guidance for a reason, right? If you follow what they ask you to do, the process is, is relatively easy. Um, yeah. It's a lot of check boxes, but you know, they, they outline it for you. So, what I would recommend, even when we were three students in an idea, we called them and we held meetings with them and we told them who we were and what we wanted to do. It's never too early to start a conversation. And yeah. I think because they knew who we were at the beginning, they saw us execute, they saw us be successful, they saw us do what we said we were gonna do um, to the point where you know, we followed their guidance to kind of a T and they appreciated it. Um, I think that that's bought us a lot of leeway in their eyes. Um, you know, they're, they're very honest with us. They tell us what they want and what they need, but they also kind of spend a little bit extra time helping us um, to make sure that we have all the resources and information we would need to get the job done. So. I would just say start that conversation. It's never too early to go and ask for a little bit of help um, and make sure you're on the right track. You know, and I would say that that's really a great recommendation, both in the investor world as well as the FDA, right? As So that way you're building relationships with potential investors before you have to ask them for money. You're, um, you know, bringing them along in the process and sharing those wins and milestones. So then when you do, they already have enough trust and confidence and know who you are, very similar to what you did with the FDA. That's a fantastic recommendation. Absolutely. So one of the questions that I get asked often, and I'm going to pose it to you, is, um, you know, are you doing any marketing? Obviously, you can't do any sales. <laughs> um, but are you doing anything 
like this show, maybe, uh, hint, hint, um, are you doing anything to build awareness and kind of create this pent up demand as you are waiting for the approval process? Or like some companies, um, you know, where you're really waiting for that approval and, um, you know, during that time you've got a plan, but you're not really executing any strategies or tactics until you get that approval. What What is the decision that you guys have made? Yeah, I think we made a very conscious effort to be in stealth mode for the last four or five years, um, just to make sure like you were describing that we were viable and uh, we had a product that we we thought had line sight to approval. I think we've just recently felt very comfortable coming out from under the rock and starting to think about being, uh, you know, moving and shaking in the in the marketing world, doing shows like this, um, doing conferences, doing presentations, speaking out about kind of what we are and who we are. Um, I think we're very comfortable that we're likely going to have approval by the end of the year. We actually recently just received acceptance for our manuscript um, mm-hmm. at a very large journal, um, and that'll be publishing very soon. And nice. our data is going to be presented at ACG in October this year. So we'll be um, hopefully hitting the limelight pretty quickly. Um, yep. And I think, you know, <clears throat> after having been in stealth mode for so long, it's it's so great to share with the public, with the community, with primary care physicians, GI physicians, that there's a new product on the market to help patients for colorectal cancer screening. Yeah, that's awesome. So exciting. You've got some really incredible miles, uh, milestones that are just around the corner. Thank you. Yeah. So um, I, you know, in some of our prep for this, uh, I, I know that there is a higher prevalence among um, minority pop- populations. Uh, do you think that based upon, you know, where the market is today, is that going to um, create additional hurdles and challenges for you to being able to get your solution in front of those populations? Or is it maybe the flip side that there are, um, creates more opportunity for you because there seems to be more of a heightened awareness and you have a lot more health plans and uh, healthcare institutions that are really trying to create more equitable equitable solutions um, across their entire population or members membership. Yeah. So I can touch on kind of our diagnostic in itself. Um, and I think that kind of addresses your question. So yeah. what we built is a colorectal cancer screening assay to detect both colorectal cancer and precancerous lesions in average risk individuals. So you turn 45 and if you don't necessarily want to go get a colonoscopy, because again, it's expensive, invasive, takes time, um, you have to take off work. Um, we've created a non-invasive solution. Credit. <laughs> uh, yeah. We've created a non-invasive solution where we drop ship you a collection kit. So it just shows up to your door um, mm. at the privacy of your own home. You produce a stool sample, put it in the kit and ship it back to our laboratory. And then we tell you if you have an increased risk of having colorectal cancer or a precancerous lesion that needs to be removed. <clears throat> so that's the process that we hope to have approval for um, again this fall and be able to market to individuals in the spring. The goal, like you were describing, is to not pull away patients that are already active in colorectal cancer screening, patients that are high risk, patients that are, you know, have great health literacy and good insurance and all these lovely things. The people that we want to reach are those that can't take time off work to get a colonoscopy, those that, um, you know, don't have the best insurance and can't afford the co-pays or the deductibles to get a colonoscopy, um, people that, you know, live in rural areas and the, local, the GI center that's closest is two and a half hours away and who's going to watch yeah. their farm when they're going to get an endoscopy. So, Our hope is, you know, while these patients are higher risk for having disease because of what you're describing, um, that we can actually help them not only get our testing done, but afterwards, if there is a positive test from us, we can help them subsequently find an endoscopy center and help them get to the endoscopy center so that they can have those lesions removed. That's great. 
that's really wonderful. Uh, just like you um, started off the conversation around your um, kind of origin story of um, focusing on Africa, um, sounds like you definitely have a heart and passion for the underserved population. I do. I think that, you know, I always say mm -hmm. that healthcare is a trillion dollar problem and everything is broken. Um, I think that that applies mm -hmm more than ever. Um, and I think it mostly applies to, to people that um, are minorities. And, you know, if this is one thing that I can do to help those people, it, it's certainly worthwhile. Sure. So, um, you know, there was a report that came out not that long ago on the top use cases for AI in healthcare, and one of the top five and probably most transformative in the next couple of years is going to be around diagnostics. Uh, are there any plans that you have of integrating AI into um, your solution to make it um, maybe more tech enabled? for greater scalability? I think there's two ways in which we've kind of already worked on that. Um, mm -hmm. So the first is with our algorithm. So our algorithm uses artificial intelligence or artificial intelligence models, um, you know, machine learning models and things like that to yeah. iterate through the data that we've generated um, and try to better understand how the RNA signatures in stool samples would be indicative mm -hmm. of colorectal cancer or precancerous lesions. So intrinsic to our test, um, we leverage AI for, for that specific reason. And I understand why other people are using it. It's very powerful. On the other side, I think the, the kind of bigger benefit in my mind is compliance. Um, so we're trying to leverage AI to help get our tests to patients, help try to understand what barriers exist from them completing a test, whether it be they, you know, can't find a FedEx all the way to, I don't want to know the results of my test. Um, and we're trying to build in our navigation system and in our, in the way that we interact with patients, um, artificial intelligence to improve the way that we help patients engage with our platform. <clears throat> One of the things that I find that's so interesting, and I'm not sure if you did this strategically or not, um, there's clearly so much hype around AI right now. I mean, even it's hard to put the television on and not have someone talking about, you know, this dystopian point of view of what AI is happening in the world today. Um, but especially in healthcare, there's so much conversation around AI. But when you took me through your story, you never mentioned AI until now when we're kind of talking about the how and the scalability. And I think there's incredible value to that um, compared to maybe some other innovators that I'm speaking to that are like leading with the, the what and it being tech enabled and AI and kind of creating this sexy hype story when really at the end of the day, it doesn't always matter how it gets done. It's it's more of the result of that. And that's really, I think, a much more powerful story than getting it all garbled up with the AI hype. What are your yeah. thoughts around that? I mean, I think there's always those, those bubbles, right? It was crypto for a while and blockchain and now it's AI. I think I don't lead with AI because I think sometimes it, it does turn investors off and it turns people off. Um, yeah. <clears throat> AI is not new, right? It's been around forever. <laughs> and we have ebbs and flows of, um, you know, the ability to leverage AI in different ways. And right now we're in kind of one of those ebb scenarios. But, you know, I've, I've read stories, for example, when they were building Lord of the Rings, they used AI to create... Um, you know, the battles and, and make the orgs attack and, and all those things. And one of the stories I heard was that the big final battle, you know, they have all these these machine learning models that are trying to take the, the final tower and the orgs recognized that they weren't going to win the battle. And they had then they started like leaving and retreating and they weren't programming, pr programming them to do that. Right. They just realized we're not going to win this battle because that's the way the story goes. Um, and they start retreating and the humans had to override that function and force them to do it. So, you know, your model is only as good as you build it, as the humans yeah. build it. And I think that that is always going to be important. There's always going to be 
a human component. And especially when it comes to healthcare, you know, machines can't care, right? Doctors care. Um, yeah. And patients know that. Uh, and so I think, especially when it comes to healthcare, we leverage AI as a, a tool to help us get our job done. But at the core, there has to be that really human component um, that's built on compassion. And, and that's why I got into medicine in the first place. So speaking of orbs, um, so I want to wrap up our conversation today with talking about Star, Star Wars. And, you know, I don't know if I would say um, what do Star Wars and healthcare have in common or maybe what did George Lucas know about the future of healthcare that we all didn't know at that time. Um, but talk about um, your passion for Star Wars and how it relates to the work that you're doing in healthcare. Absolutely. I, I've I've always been a Star Wars fan. I think I remember when I was six, my dad took me to a re-showing of A New Hope and I showed up with the buns and the, and the rope and everything. And one of the reasons that I got into medicine in the first place, I, I vividly remember when Luke's arm got cut off and they kind of created, uh, you know, a machine arm for him and um, made it look very realistic. And it was something that really influenced me in, in terms of trying to understand how we can improve healthcare and how we can get to these very fanatical ways of, of helping people and helping patients. And um, that's always driven my passion for medicine and for helping people. Um, you know, about two months ago, my son turned one, his name's Little Kenny, and we held an Obi-Wan Kenobi party. Um, so I think that that passion will continue to live on. and and hopefully continue to, to drive my ability to create innovative solutions for patients. That's awesome. That's so awesome. Well, thanks, Erica, for joining me today. Is there anything else that you would want to share with our audience while we wrap up? Sure. Just um, stay tuned and um, cannot wait to present again our data at ACG this fall in, in October um, and hopefully have approval at the end of this year so we can get one step closer to, to bring this solution to patients. So how can folks get a hold of you if anybody wants to follow up with you to learn more? Absolutely, you're welcome to visit our website, genoscopy.com. Um, we'll be putting our press release up there um, for any pending kind of manuscripts that will be published and, and ultimately the, the FDA approval application. Excellent. <laughs> well, thank you for joining me today. I appreciate it. Thank you so much. And uh, for those that are listening and haven't subscribed already, feel free to subscribe on your favorite podcast player and tune in for the next episode. Thanks for joining me. Thank you so much for listening. See you on the next episode of Health Innovators.